say because they're certified in the supply chain, then that means that will have an impact and bring it into the conflict is a big leap, right? And we challenge that notion, that premise, right? We don't believe any evidence exists that if you certify the supply chain, that's going to bring that into the conflict. Um, we have other uh, prescriptions. But uh, one of the major concerns that we have about the campaign around it, they call it the conflict-free campaign. Con from day one, the pursuit of Congolese has not been to, not been to be conflict-free. It's been to be free and liberated, right? right? right. So then you have a movement that's developing uh, around Congo being conflict-free, and those who are leading the movement are, ar are arguing that militias and rebel militias are selling minerals and killing people. Therefore, we should support the industrialization of the mining, when if you look at the Congo, the industrialization of the mining, the companies don't own it. Even one of the companies they're holding up as the example of industrialization owns gold deposits in the Congo valued around $10 billion. And they have 100% ownership of that. Another company, a South African company, has an $18 billion mine in the Congo with about 85, 90% ownership. So it does, the, the, the conflict-free approach, you have to be really careful because it doesn't call for resource sovereignty. It doesn't call for the cessation of the exploitation by industrial mining companies. In fact, it offers that as a solution, right? It doesn't say anything about US allies who have invaded the Congo twice, support proxy militia in the Congo for 70 years. And the biggest advance in bringing any kind of reprieve has been from pressure being put in the administration in Western uh, nations, who in turn say something to their allies or want to Uganda. That's where the biggest advance has come from in terms of uh, uh, advancing peace and stability, and not from mineral certification. In addition to that, it's something that's developed on the outside and being imposed on the Congolese people. There is not a conflict-free movement in the Congo. So it's not a solidarity movement, right? So although the, probably the best that we can say about it is that it's a way that people relate to it. Uh, they can see my cell phone is connected, and they understand the logic, and they bring more people in to understand. You have to be very careful. It's not a movement. We have to be careful. Recall I shared with you at the early night movement in the early 1900s was to turn Congo over to the Belgian state, right? Today, we want to be careful that we're not turning Congo over to the humanitarian institutions, mm -hmm. the corporations, right? And, fo and controlled by foreign governments like, or multilateral institutions like the UN or IMF. The movement in the Congo is for Congolese to control and determine the affairs of the Congo. And unless you can show me how conflict free leads us to that, then you know, very suspect of it. Um, there are other ways to bring it into the conflict, and the central aim, though, is for Congolese to control and determine the affairs of the Congo. The Congolese own local resources. Humanitarian institutions to come in and substitute uh, for companies institutions. Yeah, uh, what was it? So, uh, I mean, there's so much that you can put in here. So, ultimately, so what do we do? What do we do? What's oh. going to happen? Yes, um, what's hap this is what's happening. When we give you the information, you know, I'm yeah. studying. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, I studied, I studied the public.
Today she's the president of Brazil, right? We look at Ecuador, we look at Venezuela, look at Bolivia, for example. Company that's right up here in San Francisco, Bechtel, this is where they are, right? Bechtel, yeah. they moved to Baltimore? But oh, they were here, right? Yeah. What, are they, so, what do you say, that is South Africa, is that it, that South America can do it, or Africa can do it? Absolutely. Why not? developed what they call Africa Command. George Bush Sr. George W. Bush. Oh, wow. Oh, okay. In October 1, 2008, it was officially launched. And that was a question. That was definitely. Yeah, it was officially launched. And the idea was to establish a command in basis of the African country. Um, but he had um, traveled to Africa earlier in the year, in 2008, February. Um, and he was met um, by African leaders almost universally with a no. The United States is not going to establish any bases on the African continent. And only one leader, I think, um, supported it. And that was uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf uh, from uh, Liberia. But it was rejected. Everywhere he went, it was no. Um, the U.S. said they established AFRICOM to fight against terrorism and support Africans, you know, address African security interests, help Africans build wells and uh, roads and, and the work. Uh, but if you look at it, AFRICOM is a, the U.S. way of competing with China militarily because the U.S. is not capable of competing economically with China. It, China is investing a great deal in the continent where China is uh, getting minerals and in return, you know, building infrastructure. They have a uh, a $6 billion deal in the Congo, for example, where China will get copper and cobalt, and the Congolese will get um, roads, hospital, rail, and the works. The deal was initially $9 billion, uh, but the IMF 
um, intervened and told the Congolese government they can't move forward with that deal um, for a host of reasons. Uh, and then the Congolese government capitulated because they didn't have a choice. They're, they're still weak. It's a, it's a very um, weak uh, country. It's its um, GDP is like $18 billion. I was just at Stanford the other day, and the Stanford students were cha sharing with me that their, um, their um, endowment is $18.7 billion. Mm -hmm. So Stanford has more, uh, his endowment is larger than the gross domestic product of the country itself. Mm -hmm. So it's a very weak, you know, weak uh, country. Mm -hmm. um, and the IMF was funding the government to the tune of $600 million. So it capitulated. Mm -hmm. And so AFRICOM is there ostensibly to protect U.S. strategic interests on the continent. That's what it's there for. Um, and their Bush was very clever. Um, the first head of AFRICOM uh, was a black man, uh, Kip Ward, uh, came out of Baltimore, Morgan State. So he headed up um, AFRICOM um, for a while. But that's their purpose. Um, folks uh, asked us uh, around 2008, when after Obama won, what we thought Obama's policies were going to be towards the African continent. And at the time we shared, uh, a good indicator would be what he does with Africa. Would he maintain the Bush, Rumsfeld, you know, um, architecture, right? Or would he dismantle it? So a few days before he was inaugurated on, in January of 2009, he sent a shipment of uh, military equipment to Rwanda through Africa. So that set the signal. Mm. for what we see today where the United States has drone bases on the African continent, especially in the east, um, and has special operation forces in some 35 African countries. So we've seen the expansion of Africa under the Obama administration mm. and the militarization of the African continent, um, initially um, led by a, a black um, general and then a black president. Oh, the you had a second question. The current political situation. Yeah, the political stability there. Um, the government is weak. Uh, it lacks legitimacy. It stole the elections in 2011 that was held. Um, the United States backed those elections, uh, which is really fascinating. You look at uh, Venezuela, where uh, Jimmy Carter said they had the best electoral system in the world and had free votes, and the U.S. didn't recognize those elections. Mm -hmm. But the ones that were everybody universally saw that was fraudulent in the Congo, they recognized them. Um, so the government lacks legitimacy among the people. They want to get rid of the government. Um, and the government really wouldn't be in place without the backing of outside forces. Um, it gives access to the riches um, for, by, to multinational corporations, individuals in the West. Probably most egregious is, um, and Bloomberg News, Bloomberg News ran a series on this, is a gentleman by the name of Dan Gertler. He's an Israeli businessman. Uh, the government had given him a monopoly over the diamond industry. Because of his presence in the Congo, he's accumulated his wealth to $2.5 billion that he's made out of the Congo. Um, government later gave him access to copper and cobalt in the Katanga province. Um, he didn't do anything with the copper and cobalt. He just had a paper. And he used that paper to form a publicly traded company called Nikonor. And he took Nicanor, offered an IPO on the London Alternative Investment Market, and it was valued at $1.5 billion, the largest valuation on the London Alternative Investment Market for over three decades. And he didn't dig a hole, toss a pebble, or anything. He took the paper and was able to get that valuation. And recently, um, he was given, um, he was sold oil blocks off the Atlantic with Angola for about $500,000 or so. And he didn't do anything with it. And now Angola and the DRC government is going to develop those oil blocks. So they want it back. So he's going to sell it back. He sold it back to them for guess for how much? $150 million. So that's the kind of access that that government is providing to foreign corporations, individuals such as uh, Dan Gurley. So uh, 2016, um, the Constitution calls for is a term limit. And he's supposed to leave. So young people and others are mobilizing to make sure that he leaves, mm -hmm. and that Congo is endowed with a leadership that um, uh, represents uh, the popular will of the, of the people. 
So this is here in the entrance. Okay. Um, I just brought up a Wait, live stream. Oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I just brought up a live stream. If you'd be so kind to state your name again, and maybe the website that uh, is, is under you, and uh, maybe, uh, and I know on that website there's the five points you talked about, namely the, the our, our need to stop U.S. foreign policy, change it, our need to give blackberries to the to youth, the, to the youth mm -hmm. to change the conversation, and to give them uh, an exchange, and there's a couple more you mentioned, but yeah. Sure, sure. Um, friend, my name is Maurice Carney, Friends of the Congo, I'm the, one of the co-founders and its um, executive director. Um, we have two basic mandates, raise global consciousness about the situation in the Congo and provide support to local institutions. Um, our websites uh, offer information at friendsofthecongo.org. You can find out about the organization, um, get access to a whole range of uh, materials on the Congo. Uh, we have a, a global event every year called uh, Congo Week, which takes place at the third week of each October. This year is going to be from October 19th through the 25th. And um, Congo Week, you can get more information at congoweek.org. And that's where people throughout the globe, they organize events, show films, have teachings, um, all around the world in an effort to commemorate the millions of lives that have been lost. It's a way of demonstrating value for African life and also to elevate the profile of the Congo. So they do something because they value African life. They show a film, host a teaching, do a fundraiser, do a rally, the whole bit. Um, so that's congoweek.org. To support the youth, we want to connect people with the youth on the ground who are involved in the social justice movement. Uh, people can go to congoconnect.org. congoconnect.org, find out how you can get involved in providing equipment, uh, raising funds for the youth, and support their social movement. Um, challenging U.S. foreign policy. Um, highly recommend that you visit our website, uh, congojustice.org. It's a short 26-minute uh, film that lays out the history, current situation. And on that website at congojustice.org forward slash postcard, you can join our postcard campaign. So that's congojustice.org forward slash postcard. You can request postcards and we send the postcards to you. And the postcards basically are you get people to sign in and send them to the Secretary of State saying, implement the law that you have on your books. Let's say you're not supposed to be supporting conflict in the Congo. And so that's what the postcards are for. We have labor unions, women's groups, community organizations. I was just at an assisted living facility um, in Berkeley. And the old folks, they're on strollers and wheelchairs, and they're all fired up. They're like, we want a thousand postcards. We want the US to do right by the Congolese people. So if you have old folks who are on, in wheelchair and walkers can do something, Surely everybody else, uh, everybody else can do something. So those are those are some of the websites: friendsofthecongo.org, congoweek.org, and uh, congojustice.org. And for the postcard campaign, congojustice.org forward slash postcard. So let's take the last two questions. Sister here and then Tracy, the last one. So um, first, you're talking about the youth being organized and, and sort oh, okay, of um, there being an uh, online presence of. Um, organizations that tell us how we can engage people. But can you talk a little bit about um, the training that they've gotten in terms of really organizing themselves on the ground, like organizational training? Right, right. Um, and that's my first question. And my second question is, can you talk a little bit about the uh, spirituality's role in unification um, mm. in terms of like application of principles and um, ha has it resulted in assisting with organization? Wow, uh, second <coughs> question is a really good question. I guess you're familiar with Dr. Fukuyao. I can't say that I have a word pan African spiritual Yeah, organization. yeah, the, the Congo, Congo yeah, we we mentioned him uh, a couple of weeks ago uh -huh. um, because the the trip I just came back from Brazil, mm -hmm. um, Valgina Pinto, who was a spiritual leader there, was a really good friend of Dr. Yeah. Fia, okay. and Wade and Sabira Nobles were there, mm -hmm. and uh, Sister Valgina didn't know that her brother Fukia had passed. Right. They right. were with him in the hospital, had pictures of him, mm -hmm. showed her this picture. So this this connection right. keeps getting made. Right, absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Well, you know, um, uh, in Friends of the Congo, where spirituality is, is central, um, with the with the youth uh, on the ground, um, the same. Um, you have up to, depending on which source you consult, 250, 400 different ethnic groups uh, in the in the country. Um, and so they have different belief um, systems. You know, even though as you know, John and Bitti shares with us, 
and that in spite of the diverse uh, belief systems, they all pretty much have the same, you know, same principles. Um, so spirituality is, is central to their to their work. Um, even though um, I don't know if you if you've lived in Africa, you see that um, uh, African traditional yes. religion is subterranean, yes. right? Mm -hmm. um, people declare that they are Christians or Muslims, and then when things get really tight, they go back to the village, <laughs> right. <laughs> right? Right. So that's 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 still operational and very much operational in the mm -hmm. um, you know in, in the Congo. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so it, it does it does play a role. It needs to play more. You know, I think more people need to be, uh, especially those of us who are like, who, or those who characterize themselves as uh, freedom fighters and political folks, uh, they need to look and study the uh, Haitian Revolution from a spirituality perspective. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And how that spirituality served as a foundation for the greatest victory of a so-called slave state in history. Um, so I think that, that kind of, and that taps into the curriculum. And those are the kind of materials that we um, get to the youth in that they have, um, they're exposed to um, Fanon, exposed to Giop, you know, exposed to Nkrumah, you know, they're getting, so they have video um, collections um, that, they, that they share. So because what they're doing is they're, they're establishing what they call um, uh, tech centers or learning centers throughout the country. And that enables young people to come in and get all kinds of uh, training on a wide range of issues. So in terms of content, right. they're definitely fully ensconced in the Pan-African um, tradition. So the content is provided in those training uh, facilities. Also, uh, they, they do training as it relates to, um, we call it the, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee Model, mm -hmm. where they educate themselves, and they take that training, and they go into the villages and educate the villagers right. about their role and responsibility as uh, citizens, uh, about the what's at stake in the Congo, and the forces that are arrayed against um, Congolese. So they actually go into communities and, and do that. They get training in, um, they have a curriculum that's been developed for them by a Congolese elder um, that, um, that they've been following. Um, in order for uh, you to be a member you have to go through the training program. They don't just accept anybody to come yeah. in as members. They have to go through particular training. Um, they get, um, we have a, we set up a, a way that people in the Congolese in the diaspora can go back and provide training to them. Mm -hmm. um, so those Congolese, not only Congolese, but mainly Congolese and others as well can go back and provide training to them. Um, so they get training in organizational development, financial management, um, just the overall organizing process. Uh, they have workshops. Do we have uh, access to that curriculum? Yeah, yeah. You can have, you can have access to the. It's a series of um, of videos and and a lot of it is particular to you know to the Congo and the Congolese like con con condition. You know, it's it's really particular to um, you know to them because they're they're learning basic things such as what is a vote, what is a constitution. What is a social contract? Uh, that's a big deal mm -hmm. uh, between the citizens and those who are governing them. Because mm -hmm. what's the, the contract is usually being like, we come and give you a bag of rice, you vote for us, or some sugar. Right. You know? So they're trying to upend that uh, corrupt system uh, and introduce uh, you know, something uh, new where people recognize that they're the ones who choose the leaders and the leaders are supposed to come to them um, for their vote and have to buy their votes off. Once they sell the vote, they, the leader's gone. So those are some of the, some, um, just recently we had a supporter, a donor went to Kinshasa and they provided um, training in photography, for example. Um, so they get training in, 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 um, in a wide range of um, uh, activities that help them in their organizing efforts, like filmmaking, so they can document what they're doing in film. Um, so they get they get by virtue of them having these centers, mm -hmm. they able they have a facility where people can come in and um, and then get training. And in turn, once they train, they provide training to other youth mm -hmm. in the community as well. Yeah. So it's not it's not just an organization. They have a network of or, organization of organizations mm -hmm. that they call Filimbi, and um, they uh, developing a nationwide network through you know through that uh, through that coalition. Mm -hmm. So that's just a, a, a an idea of the. 
the training that they had. Yes. The system of waiting patient. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Sabrina, nice to finally meet you. Yes. Yeah. Oh, hey, Sabrina. How you, <laughs> okay. Wow, how you doing? Okay. All right. Good. Sister give, gives us a platform on uh, KPFA, yes. right? Yes. Yes. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you, Sister. Yes. So, um, there's so many different levels of corruption that um, have been allowed. You know, imperialism, colonialism, um, and everything. And but yet there is this internal grassroots empowerment. Um, what role does, does land grab play? I mean, you've got the grassroots folks that are doing everything that they can, like this is said, on a spiritual level, empowering people, you know, community by community. Um, but there is that issue of land grabbing um, that's been going on all over Africa yeah. um, by major corporations like, you know, BP and Heracles and the rest of them, the Beers, um, robbing and pillaging you know, of the natural resources, especially in the Congo. Um, because the government is so weak, are they doing anything to try to stop that land grabbing that's going on? Yeah. I mean, because a yeah. lot of the times what's been happening or what's been seen and what I've been researching is that, you know, a lot of these communities and a lot of this you know, arable land is being ruled by warlords right. within the communities. So is there anything that's being, anything being done to stop that? Yeah, thanks for the question. Whenever I think about land grabbing, the biggest land grab is the Congo. Not, notwithstanding the African continent. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, right. So there's a history of land grabbing. Right. Um, the best defense, it's happening, and, and willingly. You know, if you look next door to um, Congo, um, um, Brazzaville, um, with Dennis uh, Sasu and Gueso, um, I think he gave um, South African white farmers um, uh, land for 99 years, like thousands of acres, for pennies on the dollar. <laughs> um, so when, when you talk about land grabbing, it's interesting, it, it's a political issue. Because we're talking about sovereign states. And corporations can't go into a sovereign state and just grab land like that, unless they get permission. Right? But they are getting incentives from America. Oh, yeah, they get oh, incentives from America. I mean, you have um, the endowments of Harvard and a num number right. of other universities, not just the corporations, but the universities as well. Their and endowment or is vested, right? And Ethiopia, too. It's and Ethi Ethiopia, just Ethiopia, um, Sudan, or South Sudan now. Um, so I guess the point is that it's the governments that are in place, uh, I mean, you can, that allow that to happen, right? Um, so to address it, we need to change the government. Because you have, these are nation states, and they have sovereignty. And they're the ones who determine what happens in their territory. And what they've done is, um, we see it in the Congo, is allow that access. We shared with you with, um, with uh, Congo, Brazzaville, with Dennis Hasso and Gisso, allow that access. So it is happening. Not, not, um, it hasn't happened to the scale in um, Congo like you see in Ethiopia or South Sudan where um, acres and acres of land are given over to corporations who are using it um, to produce food, for example, that they take back to their country and that be used for the lo local, um, local community. Um, so, but ultimately, it's the state um, and the leadership that's responsible for protecting the, protecting the people. So the youth, in, not only in the Congo, but other young people, you know, uh, throughout the continent. There really is like, um, if you look carefully, there is bubbling movement among youth uh, on the continent. Whether you're talking about Jan Mar in Senegal, who challenged Wad uh, when he wanted to basically um, create um, hereditary leadership and impose his son on the people. They organized and resisted, right? Or we will see what's happening in South Africa with the economic freedom fighters with Julius Malema right now, calling for uh, nationalization and primary uh, for benefit of uh, resources for Congolese, I mean for, for South Africans, um, Pan-African Youth Network in Zimbabwe, the youth in the, in the Congo. So there's a youth movement that's clear about what's happening as a race of land grabbing, um, the role that their leadership is playing and selling off the continent, and I believe in a very short order we're going to see um, the kind of change uh, mm -hmm. that, um, uh, you know, we'd like all to see where Africans control those resources. I'm very optimistic about that. And they're looking for our support. So we need to do So we want to thank Brother Maurice uh, for sharing with us. There's a couple ways we can help. Uh, he's got postcards, website, 
a financial contribution in the basket. Old school, I'm gonna start it. I put my little piece in. Uh oh, don't let me step away. And a couple quick announcements. Um, Wose uh, meets every Sunday to, um, for history and celebration, uh, 10:30 to 12:30. Uh, two weeks from the day, two Saturdays from the day, we'll be out in the par in the uh, parking lot with Urban and Leaf. Um, we also have our um, dance movement uh, worship on the 15th, on the 16th, and on the 23rd we'll be in the park celebrating Harry Tubman in the uh, coming of spring. So once again, we want to thank uh, Brother Maurice. He's been moving. I don't know this brother well, but I know he's in it for real. Yes. He's been in Sacramento, Berkeley, yes. San Francisco, <laughs> Oakland. Wow. Got him on a plane going home. So, but thank you for the work. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. Thank you. You have more postcards? Okay. Yes. And there's postcards that folks want. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the support. Yes, yes. Have you seen them back? Good, good. You want to get one of these? Yes. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I will give them out. I'm going to take them out. You're welcome. Oh, you're welcome. Side guys. Yeah. Side guys. Side guys. Oh, I'm going to take this one. I'm going to take this one. Oh, yeah. But it ain't It's a short thing you need to be You've seen it, right? Yes, I'm lying. But uh, here's the uh, 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 Yeah, well, yeah. I was. Oh, no, I'm gone. I'm catching, I'm jumping on the plane tonight. I've been here since Monday. Several times in Africa. I was traveling, yeah. yeah I was traveling. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's a short That's an overview. It's an overview of the starts from 1885 to the present. It's happening. Yeah, I'm just not ready.